So while we all went about our lives yesterday, we came very close to a catastrophic event here on planet Earth, and we didn't know about it. It turns out we just missed getting hit by an asteroid. A piece of solid rock, roughly the size of a 10-story building. Now, I say just missed because it came within 45,000 miles of us. That's a lot closer than the moon is, and scientists say way too close for something that big. Had it struck, again, they, the people who tell us about these things, say the impact could have had the force of a 1,000 Hiroshima-strength atomic bombs over a huge area of the Earth. There are quite a few theories about how the world might end. Uh, for example, it's been suggested that there could be a big solar storm which would take the world out. Well, we get solar storms from time to time, um, and they're a bit troublesome if you're an astronaut. Indeed, not good news if you're an astronaut. But down here on Earth, we are protected by the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the magnetic field. And OK, solar storms can disturb that. They can produce currents in power lines that sometimes cause trouble. Um, they can take out satellites stop satellites working so they could affect our GPS and any telephone calls that go by satellite for example but they're not going to end the world every so often asteroids do hit the earth we know we can see some of the craters there's meteor crater or Barringer crater as it's properly called in Arizona and there's traces of a very big crater partly on the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula and partly under the sea. That big crater was the result of an impact about 65 million years ago and it's thought that's what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and many other things. So a big thing like that could cause us some problems. Broadly speaking what happens is when something big like that impacts it not only makes a crater it kicks up a whole lot of dust into the atmosphere and the atmosphere cuts out the sunlight and that stops crops growing and foods fail and there's starvation and so on. So that is something we need to look out for and we are looking out for. There's an array of telescopes all around the world monitoring the sky night after night, uh, actually monitoring about a thousand potentially hazardous objects, things that might come and hit the earth one day. As they monitor them, they discover that the vast majority of them won't, that as they get the orbit more accurately, they see it'll miss the Earth. But if there was something coming to hit the Earth, we'd get two or three years' notice. And even with today's technology, we could divert it so that it didn't impact the Earth. And there's research going on all the time which will improve that technology so that it gets easier to divert an incoming asteroid. We've got no knowledge of any big asteroid coming to hit us. Some of the techniques they use to deflect an asteroid, um, one of them is to paint it white all over, which means it reflects sunlight very well. And the sunlight bouncing off the asteroid will push it sideways so that it'll move away and not hit the Earth. That's one of the neatest solutions. But they're also developing what they call gravity tractors, satellites that are pretty heavy and through their own gravity can attract the asteroid and make it change course. And there's also some that will actually physically hook onto the asteroid and tug it aside. So there's lots of ways of doing this. The magnetic field of the Earth, the thing that makes your compass point due north, that f flips over every so often and I'm using flip as a geologist would use flip. The flip actually takes 5,000 years. Rice planting on a test basis has begun in a village near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. This comes after the central government lifted its ban on entering Kawauchi village in April. Rice planting in the area had been banned at all paddies following the nuclear accident last March. The purpose of this year's harvest is to verify the product's safety. On Sunday, about 40 farmers and volunteers began planting rice at 30 rice paddies. Fabric that absorbs radioactivity was laid near entrances over irrigation channels. 
Villagers have also sowed into the soil substances that absorb radioactivity. Once the safety of this year's harvest is confirmed, rice production will be fully resumed for the next season. I'm very happy to be planting rice along with so many others. I hope the safety of the rice will be confirmed so that the village can fully begin producing rice next year. From Plato's Republic was the idea that population should be controlled and unwanted life should be disposed of like trash. In other words, that some were worthy of life and others weren't. This is a concept that comes through in Darwin's ideas about survival of the fittest. If we are evolving towards individual perfection by natural means, that would mean that collectively we are in fact evolving towards a utopian society of perfect men and women. However, in that case, those with perceived poor genetic material would be slowing that collective evolution, and so the whole process could be accelerated by getting rid of those who are not made of the right stuff. The end goal of a utopian society of purebred humans would justify the means of getting rid of the lesser ones. Remember that the full title of Origin of Species was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. One of the major influences on Darwin was a man called Thomas Malthus, who received the blessings of French deist Jean-Jacques Rousseau and famous Scottish philosopher David Hume. Incidentally, David Hume has a prominent statue on Edinburgh's Royal Mile, and if you look at the back of it, you will see this sun god symbol. Now, Thomas Malthus authored a document called The Essay on the Principle of Population, where he concluded that, amongst other things, society should adopt policies that prevent the human population from growing disproportionately larger than the food supply. Malthus, again finding a route in Plato's Republic, proposed genocide to make sure this didn't happen. Specifically, he thought to target the poor. He says, Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses and court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlement in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and those benevolent but much mistaken men who have thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Malthus believed that by such methods, the undesirables in society could be effectively culled. He said regarding children, We are bound in justice and honour formally to disclaim the right of the poor to support. To this end, I should propose a regulation be made declaring that no child born should ever be entitled to parish assistance. The illegitimate infant is comparatively speaking of little value to society, as others will immediately supply its place. All children beyond what would be required to keep up the population to this desired level must necessarily perish, unless room be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. The logic behind the idea that those who serve society least should be destroyed was echoed under Darwinism in the survival of the fittest. The individual is lost in the collective. Again, the end of a utopian society justifies the means of killing the poor and the weak. This naturally leads to another idea put for era origin in Charles Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton. Galton regurgitated the thoughts of Plato in his work, Hereditary Genius, which was basically a racist tirade advocating a system of selective breeding for purposes of providing more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable. In other words, trying to artificially speed the upward course that evolutionists thought we were naturally already on. In truth, selective breeding had been practiced for some time amongst the elite. Inbreeding was commonplace amongst the ruling class to protect the genetic purity of their future stock. Galton merely took this idea and popularized it as a legitimate science. This very same tradition was in fact practiced by Charles Darwin himself in the hopes of maintaining a genetic superiority in his own bloodline. Darwin married the youngest granddaughter of his maternal father. Researcher Ian Taylor reveals the outcome of this project. Darwin's idea of inbreeding to produce superior stock can be seen to be a complete disaster in the case of his own ten children. Of the ten, one girl Mary died shortly after birth. 
Another girl, Anne, died at the age of 10 years. His eldest daughter, Henrietta, had a serious and prolonged breakdown at 15 in 1859. Three of his six sons suffered such frequent illness that Darwin regarded them as semi-invalids, while his last son, Charles Jr., was born mentally retarded and died in 1858, 19 months after his birth. Science has shown that inbreeding actually leads to speedier destruction of the genetic code rather than evolution because of something called biological mutations, which is why so-called purebred dogs are in fact more prone to health problems than mixes. The errors in their genetic code multiply as they are bred amongst themselves over long periods. But where true science fails, the religion of scientism continues stubbornly on. If they had followed God's wisdom in Leviticus 18, they would have heeded the warning not to commit incest and they would have been all the better for it. In their own human wisdom, however, they persisted and reaped the consequences. The idea of eugenics continued to be promoted in the scientific community for a long time afterwards. At the turn of the 20th century in 1901, the Statistics Department of London's University College became the headquarters for the Eugenics Education Society. Motivated by Galton's vision of a future utopia, ruled by a genetically engineered pure elite, the Eugenic Society grew into a successful political movement and would eventually inspire Hitler's Holocaust against the Jews. Population control is still a big issue for the elite today. As recently as May 24, 2009, the Times reported of a secret meeting of billionaires held in New York City, including the likes of Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey, where the number one issue on the agenda was how to cap the global... washing up and as it washes up it's bringing all these jelly things what is that it's all over state warns on EMP there's no help coming oh this was interesting Washington Arizona Governor Jan Brewer has signed legislation to require the State's Department of Emergency and Military Affairs to prepare materials outlining what citizens need to know to deal with either a natural or man-made electromagnetic pulse event that could knock out the vulnerable electric, electrical grid system over a wide geographical region. But if this isn't another red alert for you, I don't know what else to tell you. The legislation SB 1476 was introduced by Senator David Farnsworth. Uh, it includes the type and quantity of food, water, and medical supplies that each person should stockpile in case an EMP occurs over the U.S. What? The legislation, however, doesn't require actual hardening of the grid within the state. Unreal. And, uh, Russia sanctions, I almost read the NBA bans, Russia sanctions not tough enough yet, analysts say. Well, if they get any quote-unquote tougher, they're going to be really attacking Putin, and that's just going to make him mad. I mean, it's not doing anything. It's actually creating another financial system to fall back on when this one collapses. So, do you believe in global warming? Uh, yes, I do. Global warming is a bad way to phrase it. Do I believe in climate change? Yes. Yeah, to an extent, I do. Yes. 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 Why do you believe in global warming? Um, because there is scientifically valid proof that global warming exists. 
because uh, it's getting hotter and colder. Like, I've been in Georgia my whole life, and we've never really seen snow the way we've seen it the past two years. Yeah, so. Because I think that humans have a, an effect on the planet that has been absolutely. Yeah. It's self evident. The ice is melting. We're all doomed. We're all gonna die. I really don't know what's going on with the government. I know there are tons of weather machines. I know all the weather isn't real weather, so it's kind of like, who knows, you know? Right. One minute it's snowing, one minute it's raining, then it's hot and it's cold, so you just roll with it. Yeah, climate change or global warming, uh, yeah, I'm fairly certain that it's, you know, created by uh, the activities of humans. <laughs> Do you uh, have any ideas of how we can make the picture? Eat the rich. That's all. Right. That's all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, here's why some believe a pole shift, a serious one, a complete one, may be on the near horizon. On December 29, 2003, NASA released this article about our migrating pole. The bottom location, 1831, in approximately 70 years it moved up one notch to 1904. Approximately 70 years later, up in 1972, it moved considerably more. And it moved about that same distance in 29 years, well less than half the time. Now the magnetic north was measured in 2005 at 82.7 degrees north, 114.4 degrees west. Now each block here is 5 by 5 degrees, so it would be about uh, here where the cursor is. A later study revealed that the pole is trekking towards Russia at about 40 miles per year, but not there yet. And that's all we know. Russia and Europe got tossed this winter. The USA had a light go of it. But the North Pole has not been measured in Russia. And if you happen to know otherwise for a fact, please send a link. Let's be clear. The increasingly fleet-footed North Pole may change direction, stop entirely, speed up, or something else. This may never be anything to worry about. And then again, a complete magnetic reversal could happen this century. Or this year. If you read these articles, you will see that the pole is not going at a constant speed. Take that into your considerations. Be safe, everyone. In 812, when the fourth angel blew his trumpet, one-third of the sun, one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars were struck, so that one-third of them turned dark. One-third of the day was kept from shining, and also the night. I believe this judgment may be declaring a shift in the axis of the Earth. This would cause a third of the day to be lost as the Earth starts to revolve around a new axis, which would alter the orbit of the Sun, Moon, stars and planets. And the Sun would rise and set in a different place. And the Moon would also appear to have altered its orbit. A shift in the axis of the Earth could indeed cause a third of the day and night to be lost. And instead of a 24-hour day, we would experience a 16-hour day. If the Earth loses eight hours, then sunset would occur at about 10 o'clock in the morning, which means all the clocks in the world would have to be reset. God has done things like this before. In 2 Kings 20 verse 8, God made the sun go backwards and then forward again, which would mean that the Earth's rotation would have rolled back and then forward again. And during the days of Joshua in Joshua 10 verse 12, God made the sun and moon stand still for a while. Which means that both the earth and the moon's revolution stopped altogether. The technology does exist. Uh, it, it is real as you or me. And, and it's a whole lot more out there than even the most diehard believers could, could possibly fathom. The, the truth is that we, and by we I mean this planet and the people of this planet, are in essence blind to what is really going on in the cosmos and interstellar space. What people call aliens, uh, we call IBs, or, or in layman's terms, interdimensional beings. And what we found out and have known about since the early 70s is that, in simplest terms, other dimensions or planes, as we call them, exist and lay on top of each other, almost stacked, as if you had a blanket with another blanket stacked on top of it and another blanket stacked on top of it. 
to explain it so you can understand, you can imagine the Earth and our reality as a thin blanket. And all of these other higher dimensions are the blankets laying directly on top of ours. However, we can only see our own blanket. Now the alien beings, or the ships that we have seen in videos, and that many people have, have captured over the years, are in fact what we call jumpers in that they exist in their relative dimensions but have in fact jumped into ours. Uh, we have discovered that most of the time we are unable to see them as they are at a wavelength uh, indifferent to our own and our senses, eyes, and ears cannot detect. Um, from the information that I have gathered and been briefed on Every planet, star, and galaxy within our own plane and universe, as we see it, exists also in these other dimensions. Uh, we've detected that we know of and that I've been briefed on at least four other dimensions that do exist. Now, as I said, every planet we know of, every galaxy, does exist in these other dimensions. However, with each new dimension, each planet, galaxy, star takes on a different form. Uh, to explain it in the most simple, simplest terms, you can look at our own planet, Jupiter, which is in the outer reaches of our solar system. Now, to us, it, it's a deadly gaseous planet, completely uninhabitable. However, when you look at Jupiter in an elevated dimension, you will see that it is completely changed in all forms. You will see that it's no longer a deadly ball of gas, but is now solid, has a different color, and is now inhabited. We know for a fact this is true due to the fact that the government has the technology to detect these higher dimensions and actually get a small view of what the solar system looks like on the other side, as we call it, in these other dimensions. There is much we do not know about the universe and how it works. However, here are the facts that I can confirm as truth and were made known to me and that I and the other people that I worked with have been briefed on. Now, we are not alone in the universe. Uh, there are alien beings within our own dimension of space, as well as other dimensions. The planet Earth is an early, at least two dimensions below our own plane. Uh, but that, that is as far as I will go regarding that. Now, I'm getting a little bit low on time, so I, I will leave you with a few other important things that people will no doubt want to know about later in time once this video is made public. Now, these are things that I have been briefed on by my superiors and that are common knowledge in the Black Ops community. Now, the planet that we know of as Mars was at one time inhabited, uh, but again, at one time, was wiped out by the people who inhabited the planet which were much more technologically advanced than we are, uh, which we, we discovered by testing and analyzing the chemical residue uh, found from the blasts around the planet, uh, as well as artifacts that we've also discovered on the planet, including the infamous glass tubes seen in the few of the publicly made photographs from NASA. Uh, now, these are not glass structures, but a glass-like material that is about a thousand times stronger than any material or steel that we have on our own planet. Uh, these tubes were used as a means of travel uh, underground and above ground by the people who inhabited this planet. Uh, it is thought from our research that there are still uh, uh, an ET presence inhabiting Mars, uh, but uh, again, this is this is as far as I will go, uh, and that I was briefed on regarding that matter. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be completely vague, but I am trying to give you a picture of, of what is going on out there that that doesn't completely put me in in 
more danger than I am already in just by revealing the few things that I have. Uh, one of the last things that I will reveal, uh, and that is definitely a fact, and that I have been briefed on, and that many other people involved with the Black Op community have been briefed on, and that is our own moon, uh, which does in fact have alien bases on it, and also has bases from our own government. Uh, now, there is an ET presence, which is primarily located on the dark side of the moon. The Apollo program was in all actuality a reconnaissance mission so that we could research what was exactly there and who. Uh, you will notice that many of the photos from the Apollo missions uh, have airbrushed out buildings and bases and this is the truth of the matter. Uh, about half of the video that that you will see that is document, documented from the Apollo missions uh, was in fact shot here on Earth at Area 51. In fact, if you look at satellite imagery, you can actually see what's left of a crater field uh, created at Area 51 that was used in the filming. Now, the, the, the truth is that most of the footage from the moon was simply cluttered with bases, with alien buildings, and from what one astronaut said, and I'm quoting, uh, what were constant a constant presence of alien vehicles flying over the surface, uh, cluttering up the footage. So again, they showed the American people what they could, and recreated the rest uh, here on Earth that they couldn't show. Uh, from what we know, the dark side of the moon is where most of the alien presence is located. Uh, it, it's it's a more primitive alien race from what we can see and our research tells us. Um, it's it's more primitive than the alien beings you would see on higher dimensions, but still thousands if not millions of years ahead of us. Uh, now we have our own bases, uh, which are primarily located in or near the Sea of Tranquility, which is the site of Apollo 11 and also one base that I know of located near the crater Sabine D. Uh, to this day, we are still sending secret missions to and from the moon. Uh, however, I do not know the complete details of what we are doing. The war is being waged that you may know nothing about, the war against the homeless. On April 18th, the ACLU sent a letter to both the Department of Justice and the Detroit Police Department urging that the practice of dumping the homeless be stopped. A year-long ACLU investigation claims the following. Detroit police officers stopped people perceived to be homeless in the tourist area of Greektown in Detroit. They forced them into vans, took them for a ride, and deserted them miles away. The sad truth, Detroit isn't the only city that treats the homeless this way. Joining me now from Detroit is Michael Steinberg, legal director of the ACLU of Michigan. Nice to have you, Michael. Thank you, Melissa. So tell me, what did your investigation show that the police were doing to folks who are experiencing homelessness in Detroit? Essentially what the police were doing were kidnapping individuals off the streets of tourist friendly areas of Detroit, putting them in handcuffs, uh, throwing them in the back of a wagon or a police car, and transporting them either outside the city or to deserted parts of the city and abandoning them. They then tell the individuals that they weren't welcome back into Greektown or other tourist friendly areas. Uh, sometimes they'd make it difficult for them to return by making them throw their money down a storm drain. And the problem, of course, is that the lifeline uh, for many of these individuals uh, is in Greektown. There mm -hmm. are warming centers, there's food and churches and other services. So they'd have to walk sometimes through the middle of Michigan winter. Um, one person had a blood clot in mm. his leg and it took him over three hours to get back. Michael, I want to take a moment and listen to some of the men talking about their own experiences and then I'll, I'll have you respond to something. Okay. Did not ask who we were? You know, get in the van. I asked him if I was free to go. He told me no. We took like maybe a, a 15 minute ride. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're ending up. Maybe when you get there, you're uh, you're abused in some way. Um, what 
would that feel like? And we walk him back. It took us almost five hours to get back from walking. It was cold. So, Michael, have the, have the Detroit Police Department or the Department of Justice addressed these concerns? Well, we had the quickest response time in Detroit by the police uh, in history, I think. As soon as we sent our letter, um, they sent over two members of internal affairs uh, saying they wanted to investigate it. Um, they've met with some of the individuals that we've spoken to, and we hope it will put an end to it. Um, we've also reported it to the Department of Justice because we believe that the practice violates the consent judgment that was entered into between the DOJ and the Detroit Police Department. So, Michael, part of um, what we've been talking about this morning is criminalizing drugs. But there's also this kind of impact of criminalizing homelessness. And, and we were looking at not only in Detroit, but sort of all over the country, municipalities doing things like making it illegal to, to sleep or sit um, on, in a store or in personal buildings, um, laws punishing people for begging or panhandling, uh, enforcement of these so-called quality of life ordinances. Um, tell me, is there a war on the homeless? It, you can definitely appropriately characterize it as a war on the homeless. Uh, we are challenging a state law in Michigan that makes it a crime to beg in public. Um, we have represented individuals who have been uh, charged with trespass for sleeping on public land. They're essentially criminalizing the status of being homeless. Uh, society. If, if we want to stop seeing homeless people on the streets, we as a society has, have to treat the problem as a social problem, mm -hmm. not a criminal justice problem. Uh, we have to provide mental health services to those who need it. We have to provide uh, drug treatment mm -hmm. programs for those who need it in public housing. We can't yeah. make it a, a crime to be homeless. It's not, homelessness is not going to go away yeah. by making it a, a illegal. Michael Steinberg in Detroit, I, I so appreciate that point and it, it dovetails so nicely with what we're talking about in, in terms of drugs. We have, a, we have a set of social responsibilities, epidemiological problems here. It is not solved through criminalizing. Thank you for your work. Thank you.